Welcome to Episode 2 of the Ministry of Motion Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Todd Schaefer. My first guest is a screenwriter who's written 12 Christian films that have been produced and released. He's been slugging it out in the Christian film industry for more than a decade, with most of his films being made for pure flicks. His name is Sean Paul Murphy. If you've, if you've been looking at Christian films, you'll know that quality is never job one. As I begin this venture talking to people who are in the Christian film industry, my main purpose is to listen. I want to hear what Christian filmmakers have to say about the struggles that they have faced in this unique industry. I met Sean at his home in Baltimore, Maryland, and I asked him to walk me through his experience in Christian film, which he gladly did. You know what? You know what? Like having a small home allows you to do. Say no. <laughs> yeah. That's the ultimate power in the film business: is the yeah. power to say no. Not to yes, worry. That is for sure. That is for sure. And after I stopped, you know, for about a period of about two years, I turned down every job. I was like turning down a job every two months at least. Really? Yeah. And why? We'll get to. But um, basically, <laughs> basically. You know, I didn't want to make any more crappy movies. I didn't want to make movies that no one would see. Why don't you, before we get, get too far, why don't you just give me a nutshell of your career, what you're doing, what you've done. So, um, my name is Sean Paul Murphy. I am a screenwriter. I'm an editor. I'm a producer. And I'm not a director. And I'm not an actor. <laughs> Worked in an advertising agency, which, uh, in the broadcast department. I eventually left there to become a freelance film editor. And, um... But also I left to pursue screenwriting. This is around the time when I left the advertising agency. I was I had just I'd already had interest in two scripts and it was around this time where I got a it looked like my third script was gonna get made. I was very hot at the time, but it then took a long time to get a movie made. But I was getting like um I was picked up by uh, Stu Robinson and um it was Robinson Wine, Trav, and Gross at the time. And I was familiar with the agent because he was a lot. This was during the um, the spec years, you know, when the spec market screenplay was so hot. And he was quoted in a number of screenwriting books mm -hmm. as an agent. So I was very happy to get him. In fact, I literally turned down CAA to go with oh, Stu. Wow. You know, CAA was actually interested in a Christian script of mine really? that I had written called Then the Judgment. But and I, I was I was shopping around two scripts at the same time. CAA was interested in that. Was they they said they were interested in some minor changes before they would pick it up. And Stu read another script of mine called The Long Drive. Now the uh, the uh, the Christian script that CAA was interested in was a, a horror script, and I'll leave it at that. But it was a cr deep Christian themed horror script, and um, probably more Christian than most of my Christian films. Huh. And um, has it been made? No, because I'm I help. It's been optioned, but I've hold, I'm holding it back because I'm going to write a novel version of it first. Oh, okay. So, because um, I because I could see these characters through at least three books, you know. But That's um, great. and so I, I I've pulled it off I've pulled it off the market. I could probably get it made easily if I if I wanted to. But um, but uh, Stu read the script as well, and he said, "Look, Sean, this is really good." He goes, "But if your first script to get sold in out." out here is is, um, is a horror film. He goes, you're going to be typecast as a horror film writer yeah. for the rest of your career. Yeah. He goes, this other script, A Long Drive, it's a character-driven story, it's a character study. He goes, when you write something like this, you can go anywhere and do anything. He goes, and this is the skill that they that really gets paid in Hollywood. Hmm. Didn't prove to be correct in my case. but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I was like, once Pitch Stew picked me up, I was getting like great letters from Barry Levinson and Ultimately, that's how my first movie got produced was because um, I knew someone who knew Levinson. And when I got this letter, when Stu sent me this letter from Levinson saying that I was a very good writer, I took it over to that guy uh, who I knew. And I said, look, is this, is this Barry's signature? He's like, yes, it is. <laughs> and then Sutton, that guy ended up being the director of um, my first film, 21 Eyes. Oh, okay. You know, and because suddenly I had been working with this guy. He was a director, and I was like a low-level producer at the agency, so I never hired him personally, but I knew him very well. And when I went freelance, I was editing stuff for him, but once he, once I had um, approval from Barry Levinson for my writing talent, and this guy wanted to make a feature too, you know, that was, um, 
you know, all all the prestige I needed was to, uh, you know. So I was a long time before I got anything produced. But part of it was when I started writing, I was working at the advertising agency. It was a lot of fun, but it didn't pay much money, and I was just a kid. Yeah. And when I became an editor, is like literally, my you know, my income increased by like five times what I was making. But when I became a you know, self-employed, you know, freelance editor, and then suddenly like. I no longer had a financial incentive to write, so I was really just writing for myself after that okay. point. You know, so it's sort of like, yeah, it'd be great to make something, but and I reached a point in my career too where I was, um, I was doing things just for the writing challenge. It'd be like, oh, I'm going to write this script where the conflict is entirely internal, you know. And I succeeded at that, but it's like that's not why people go to the movies. It's, that's why people yeah. read books. Yeah, you true. know, and then like I wrote a mob film. I'm like, I want to write a mafia movie, crime movie, where you don't hear a gun fired until the third act. And I, you know, just so it's true that I could compel with the characters. And I did that, and I don't know if that one ever got optioned. But, but once again, people who like mafia movies like shooting throughout. You know what I mean? Yeah, they so, do. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of like, and that one had a very good redemptive themes. I almost um, tried to convert it into a straight up Christian film, but. When I did, it just became so heavy-handed that, in my opinion, it lost whatever charm it had. Okay, yeah. And I felt it essentially had the same message without the, um, yeah. without the sinner's prayer and all yeah. that thrown into it. Right. You know. But eventually, um, after the release of my first film, 21 Eyes, I was very disgusted. Now, I've been writing Christian theme stuff and outright Christian stuff. And, and the funny thing is, when I was writing that stuff in the 90s, no one looked at it as a specific genre. Right. They looked at it as the story, like my horror movie. They thought, "Wow, this is you know this is a good, compelling story." They didn't think they didn't think much. The Christian stuff fit in with the story, yeah. so they wouldn't say like cut the Christian stuff out because it was all part of the, part of the package. Right. And as which a result, it should be. Yeah, which is the way it should be. <laughs> and like uh, I also had an End Times movie before the, the Left Behind books came out. I could have invented that genre, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And I, you know, there was a there was second agent who was interested in me. One well, first agent was really a lawyer. Second agent was a Jewish um, agent who didn't handle writers; he handled directors. But he got he read my script. And he tried to put a deal together with it, with a director he handled. He subsequently is no longer an agent; he's a producer. But um, and he said he really loved the script because he didn't look at it as a Christian film either, or as a biblical end times revelation thing. What he looked at it was was a um, was an analogy of the Holocaust. Yeah. He said, this is a Rod Sterling-esque sci-fi tale that, you know, looks at the Holocaust. Right. And he's like, you know, he goes, and he goes, because he says, this is difficult for me to handle because, you know, I'm Jewish and I don't like to be anything to be too Jewish. So it's funny, he was accepting this Christian film I wrote as huh. being a uh, Jewish film, huh. you know, and he was like, I don't want to feel like I'm pushing my, my faith on people, yeah, right. you know, and in the real, it was a Christian faith being pushed on people. Yeah. Now, if you hand out a Christian thing, if they see Jesus or they see the content, they immediately think, oh, we can't spend more than $2 million on it, right. and it's only, it has to be marketed in an excellent way. That's, what, that's why I wrote a blog at seanpaulmurphyville.com <laughs> called... Um, Building the um, Christian, um, building the Christian ghetto, uh, because which is how I connected with you. Yeah, you connected me through this blog, and um, it's been great. A lot of people have been contacting me. A lot of younger filmmakers who have seen the way the Christian films are going, and they don't like it. Yeah. And um, and I, you know, I should say I had my share of the Christian films and and the Christian market, and. Um, and that, you know, it, we are, by making, it seemed like it was a good thing when this was happening, that we were making our own genre. Yeah. But, you know, as it kept going on and on, it's sort of like, why, these are the questions you got to ask yourself, is why are you making Christian films? Right. You know, or, if, you know, let's go, you know, some people really despise the term faith-based, you know, yeah, because it's, right. and it goes, you know, you know, even some of the people like Christianos, you know, who I communicate with, you know, on like Facebook and all, and every, the hill occasionally gets snarky if I say faith-based and they like a Facebook pro, and like, <laughs> what faith would that be? You know, is it a Buddhist, is it a Buddhist film? Is it a Hindu film? And where did film? that come from? I mean, that, that if people are, people are ashamed of you for Jesus yeah, they or they Christian. Yeah, they say Christian. You know, yeah, so they say faith-based. Yeah, that's And, right. um, so it really is just, it's just a shame thing. Yeah. You know, so, um, 
That's what I was always wondering. Because that's what I suspected. Yeah, a hundred percent. When I started, it was Christian. I started making Christian films, and, uh, and I ended up making faith-based films. <laughs> <laughs> and is it even a genre? That's what I, I don't. I've been wrestling with. Oh, it is. It is. A it genre. Is, it is. Or a is genre. it? Is because it's more of a worldview than really a genre. No, like it, said, no, it's not a worldview. Because you can have this worldview outside of Christian films. You know, it, this is a genre because there are certain rules that you have to use. You know, and uh, this is not a worldview. And the, more, the Christian films that are being made today you know, are a genre. There are a certain well, set of rules. And well, they're being yeah, they're being packaged as a genre for sure. But you know, I mean, if, if you have like a western or a, a, a horror, like you said. Wait a minute. Why, the why western. Would... Let's see. The western. Here's the western. It's um, <laughs> it's a guy. He was a bad man, and he becomes a preacher. <laughs> and then somebody kills, comes in, kills his wife or his kid or the town. Yeah. And then he's got to debate whether to put the gun back on or not. Right. Yeah, seen that. Yes. <laughs> seen that like eight times. Yeah, I'm you sure. know? We've, we've all seen that one. <laughs> yeah, and let's see. Okay, we get the pastor who loses his faith, and then something yeah, happens. Yeah, you're right. And okay, comes when back. you look at it that way, yeah, you can I, see the genre, the and, genre coming through. You're and, right. um, one, at least, at least when I was doing, uh, I was writing um, a lot of com pretty much everything was commissioned. So at least the stories were dictated. Um, I think I've written all of the faith, and I have. I mean, I I'm still going to. My faith is going to be on everything I write, one way or another. Right. However, but there, I've written every kind of Christian story that's acceptable in the genre. So for me to write any more of these. Is just repeating myself. Yeah, but it, it came down. It came down less to the fact that I felt I was repeating myself is the fact that. But let me let me say you know um, these are all old school Christian films now. They were once you know at the at the forefront. But I wrote this script called I John, which is in development right now, and um, looks like it's going to be made. It's going to be a theatrical film, or possibly we're thinking of adjusting it the uh, pitch. To try to get it made as a something at Showtime as a ten-part series, huh. which I'm really negligent on. So, got, you know, Sherry, you know, if you're listening to this, Julie, I'm sorry, Colton, I'm sorry. I had other things came up, family things, but New Year coming. I'll get back <laughs> to it in case you're listening. So, um, after my first film, Twenty One Eyes, that was actually produced was made, I was very disgusted with um, the distribution deal, yeah. you know, and. Um, I did not. I did not like it at all, and I decided, you know, I wanted to make a film that I could distribute myself. You know, I, I went down the same route that so many filmmakers were going to go. So I, I'd already had an idea that I'd been wanting to write a long time, like a Christian idea. So I decided to write it, and I wrote it up, and it seemed good. And I was going to um, going to produce it myself here in Baltimore, and um, I was going to raise like the budget, and then two times, you know, like three times the budget essentially and spend the rest of the money on marketing. I was going to do sort of in the Cristiano, I don't know if you're with like, familiar with like Rich and Dave Cristiano. No, I'm not. They are sort of, I would call them the godfathers of the current Christian independent film market. And um, like Dave White and all got their start in like Cristiano films. Some people would say the real guy who started was that guy who did Thief in the Night in the 70s. Have you ever saw that? Yeah, yeah. But um, Cristiano had a pretty good marketing plan, the Cristiano Brothers, and they did a number of films, and and then, you know, Cloud 10, and then you'd have the occasional, you know, anomaly like uh, Mel Gibson's um, Passion, which really upped the stake. So I, so I wrote this film, I decided to check out, to check out um, Christian films that were currently out there, to see who was produ who was distributing them, you know, what, were they, what did they look like, and I was... Really unimpressed, you know. Sorry, guys. And uh, but I I did like these films that I would see like David White in, you know, because I thought they were they made an attempt not just to tell a sermon, but an attempt to kind of tell like a you know a thriller or this or that, and have like a have like a real plot with stakes, mm -hmm. and they bring in some actors you've heard of. Right. So um, I decided I was going to look these guys up and. Uh, at the time, I got I managed to find Bobby Downs, who like runs Christian Cinema. Who I think he was one of the producers of. Um, I can only imagine. I found his email, so I you know I decided you know just send see what they thought of my script. So I I, I sent him an email, 
at the same time, I was also marketing a horror film, and um, so to other people. And I didn't hear back from Bobby, but I got got an email from this guy, Dave David White, and he goes, "Hey, send send me the script." That's all it said. And I didn't, you know, because I never sent an email to David White, so I didn't know who he was. Yeah, I'd seen a couple of his films during my research, but I didn't associate this. I didn't think that the actor right. would be sending me an email back when I sent it to the producer, Bobby Downs. And since I was marketing two scripts, I had to do that very embarrassing thing of saying, what script are you, um, do you <laughs> want? Because the Christian guys would not necessarily like the horror script and the... Horror, and the horror people would certainly not necessarily like the Christian script. Yeah. So he's like, I want to read both of them. And I said, well, read this one first. <laughs> so I sent him I sent him my script, I, John. And um, so I heard back from him like three days later, and he's like, we really like your script. And he, go, and he goes, what we really like about it is that it has a sense of humor. He says, There's n these um, Christian scripts are so humorless. You know, they're so serious and humorless. And I go, oh, good, you're interested in making it. And he's like, oh, no. He goes, um, there, there's no, you know, there's no roles for Kevin, meaning Kevin Downs, or me in the script. And we like to make films that we can star in. So um, that's why, you know, that, that, and that pretty much summed up everything up. So what they said was, he goes, what we want to do is write a film that's like the big chill but with Christians. And would you be, in, you know, so it would be mainly be a comedy. And would you be interested in writing that? And I go, well, I don't like to write comedy alone. You know, because I always think it's good to bounce comedy off people. And I said, um, I have a friend, um, Tim, who's very funny, and, I, and he's also a writer. And I said, could I call him, bring him in? They're like, you can bring anybody else you want in, but we don't, we're not going to talk to him. So we wrote this film. It eventually became uh, called Hidden Secrets. But as we were writing it, it was called uh, Christian Big Chill. You know, so thou shalt not steal. You know, but... <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> and that was their general way of doing it. The film ended up starring um, John Schneider from Dukes of Hazard. You know, and... Um, you know, uh, Stacy Keenan, who was on Step by Step in another show. And now this was Eagle Rock, or this was well. Then when they place. contacted me, they were doing a, they were working for Eagle Rock. All my initial contracts were Eagle Rock, and this was going to be Kevin Downs, Bobby Downs, and um, Dave White. But they split before the script was even done, and so it, it ended up being pure flicks. And what I was told the split was caused by. Um, Kevin and um, Bobby wanted to do fewer but bigger films, and David and the other folks wanted to do more films and at a lower budget. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it was told. So I guess um, I and guess different visions. Yeah, anyway. different different visions. Yeah. And as a result, Kevin Downs is not in this film, but David White is. But they they still remain friends. And um, David used to do this show called um, One Man Show called. Um, Holy Man Undercover, he would do it around the country at churches, not anywhere near enough churches because he wanted to make a lot of income, you know, with a show like this, but he got very few things. But he had a, he had a, sh a booking up in New Jersey, and he asked Tim and I if we'd come up, if we wanted to come up and watch him perform his live show, and we're like, sure, and as we were driving up to Tim, I, you know, Mike Debbie was there as well, I said, Tim, this is not a visit, this is a job interview. Like, you think so? I'm like, 100%. So we went out to dinner afterwards with a guy who's still a great friend, a guy who had sponsored the show in um, New Jersey, a guy named um, Paul Castilla. So uh, we went up there, and he asked us to do it. Now, the one-man show was written by a, a David and a woman named Jill Gatsby, and, um, and I couldn't believe the show when I saw it because it was just completely laced with sex and drug humor. Basically, it's kind of the story of his life. So it's about a kid who goes to Hollywood, very naive, and he, and he ends up getting into the movies, and his uncle's telling him to be a, a movie missionary, and he gets sucked up into the fame and everything. And um, this had Fred Willard in it, who we always love Fred Willard. You know, I always loved his work. It had John Schneider in it again. It had Stacey Keenan in it again. <laughs> and then Joe Pesci had been out for uh, movies for a while and was coming back. Oh, yeah. So we were going to get Joe Pesci. So we had to rewrote that, rewrite that role again for Joe Pesci, and uh, you know, for, before it was presented to him. And then, then we rewrote it for Fred Willard, and Fred was in it, and Fred was great. And 
as much you know as much as I you know love what he did, I was and he was the, he was the first actor who ever did this. Tim and I went out to the set for this movie, and um, when Fred first came on, you know he was the big star in the film. You know maybe John Snyder would disagree, you know, but um, Fred was the big star. <laughs> and before the first, you know, he's in makeup. He still has the thing around his suit, you know, because you know to play, you know, where they put around you so the makeup doesn't get on your suit. He gets onto the set where he's going to do the first shot. And he calls, are, are the writers here? Are the writers here? And we were sitting on some stairs away, and we came down, and he goes, oh, I just want to thank, I just want to say, this was great, this is a very funny role, you know? And, I mean, no writer had ever, no actor had ever come out, and for someone with Fred, Fred Willard's comic yeah, yeah, timing, for sure. it, was, it was great to hear, and... You know, because he does all those uh, mockumentary films where they, they add yeah, live a lot. Yeah, Best in Show was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, this had, I had just seen, you know, um, that was probably one of the more recent things I'd seen him in. Best in Show is probably my favorite comedy of that decade. So I was hoping he was going to add lib. But he just did the script straight through. <laughs> but he's still, he's still hilarious in it. So, that, I mean, that was... That was a really wonderful experience, you know, out on the set of that movie, you know, working with these people. And, um, of course, the movie went horribly awry afterwards. It was The first draft of this film was extremely funny. I think everyone's willing to confess that, you know, but it's a Christian film. So uh, we'd already really pulled back on the drug humor from what was in the original one man show. And a lot of uh, we pulled back on a lot of the humor. But we added a lot of additional humor. But... We, were, we showed it to somebody. I know who it is now. It was somebody at TBN. He's like, we really love this. I really love this movie, but I think this character, you know, it crosses the line, you know. I think it may be, people will find it offensive. And Dave was like, okay, we'll cut it out. And at that point, and I'm like, oh, yeah, they're interested in it? Oh, yeah, we should cut it out. And it was the investor who said, look, why are we cutting it out for this guy? He goes, he's not offering us a deal. He's just saying, hey, this, you have a better chance if you cut this out. Because what are we going to do if the next person's interested and they want to cut something else out? And that's essentially what happened. Anytime anyone objected to anything in the film, it got cut out. Oh, my gosh. You know, and then we had a disastrous screening. And this was up in northern, Baltimore, northern um, Maryland somewhere. A friend of mine went to this church. And the pastor's son would, and this was really, if you were to look at a ministry of a film, we didn't discuss this, but, you know, if you're making a Christian film, I think there should be some sort of ministry to it, that there's some sort of need that you're meeting. Yeah. And this was about, this was aimed at, like, kids, it would be like, you don't have to give in to the culture, you know what I mean? Right. Stand your ground, this is what makes you unique, people will like you because you're yourself. Yeah. You know, so it was aimed at, like, the teen market, and a lot of the comedy was goofy. So... A friend of mine went to this church and said the pastor's son, who was a teenager, late teens, has a screening at his house every Sunday where all the kids come over and watch a movie. And I'm like, oh, well, let's um, let them watch this movie. And we, uh, through the go-between, it's like, yeah, we'd love to watch this movie. So, and we made, t we had, you know, I had copies of, like, screening cards. Yeah. And we made the screening cards up. And I think my wife was there and was Tim there. Yeah. And uh, we were in another room. We didn't want to hinder them. But they watched the movie. They and they literally laughing. laughed all the way through it. And huh. they you know. would roll back the movie. And they would roll it back. And watch, watch it over. And, and watch I it I mean, over. watch parts. Parts of oh it over. Oh, my gosh. Like they were laughing. Their so afterwards, we're thinking, oh, my God, we got a hit. And we were going, cha-ching, cha-ching, you know. Yeah, I mean, we weren't thinking about... Okay, we were. Yeah, that much. we were like, this is magic because we loved it because it was so funny. Then disaster struck. So I bring in the screening cards, and I'm handing them out, and the pastor's son's like, do you want us to evaluate this film as evangelicals or as normal people? I wasn't expecting that question. I said, um, um, whatever you feel more comfortable. And, you know, and so we get the screening cards back, and you would have felt, thought we showed them the triumph of the will or something, you know, because they hated the movie. And, I, you know, afterward, Dave's calling me, and he's like, so how, how's the screen? I go, the screening was great. They laughed all the way through. Good. What about the cards? I said, I'm not going to send you the cards. I go, why? He goes, because I said, I said, just trust me. You don't want to see the cards. I go, just trust that they laughed all the way through. We need to see the cards. Send them the cards. Panic. So after that, essentially, every, um, every time they showed it to somebody, someone would object to something. 
and it would get cut out of the movie. By then, the, the edit had returned to L.A., so I wasn't even sure what the movie was anymore myself. And, I mean, and ultimately what came down and what killed the movie is, at one point, the actress played by Jennifer Lyons, the David White character says, I'm not interested in her. And she's like, of course you're interested in me, everybody is. And she, like, goes over and kisses him, and then he has no response to it. In the end, it was that kiss that killed the film. Huh. Because they felt that the kiss was inappropriate. So while that was going on, we got a call to do um, Sarah's Choice, which was a pro-life film. Um, and um, an investor had seen a debate on television. Somebody on television talked about abortion, who was making false statements and in the investor's mind. So the investor wrote up this little treatment. Dave gave it to Dave. You know, generally the movies were generally... A lot of the Pure Flix films at that time were investor-driven. Investors would want to make a movie about a certain subject. They said, can you make a movie like that? Oh, yes, we can. Sean, Tim, write us a movie about this. So uh, we got the treatment, which what we normally would do would throw out the treatment and write our own movie. So we wrote this film, and they brought in um, Rebecca St. James, the um, singer. Right. And, um, and, you know, the best thing about this movie was they we got the assignment around Thanksgiving or right before Thanksgiving, and Hollywood closes down like by the second week of December. So we had to have the first draft of it in two weeks. Oh my gosh! You know, so we wrote the first draft of this so they could go into casting, so and so that they could shoot and start shooting in January. No, you got to be kidding me. Nope. So, um, and this is you know actually I would say the three films I'm proudest of of the faith based ones are Sarah's Choice. Um, Hidden Secrets and The Encounter. And yeah, after that, The Encounter sense. 2. Now, this film, <laughs> we screened it. Um, the director took it away. We didn't go out to L.A. for the shoot because they weren't going to pay us. So, But they shot some of it in Ohio where the director lived. And my wife and I went out to Ohio for the shoot. And Pure Flix partner, um, Russ Wolf, who is now deceased, was the partner in charge of the film. And, you know, I'm deciding to go out. And I brought the investor to this movie, too. So um, that, the other investor kind of dropped out of that. So we're riding out. And I'm, my wife's driving. I got the most recent copy of the script. And I'm looking at the scenes we're going to watch and shoot. And I was like, I didn't write any of these. They were all written by the director. Wow. Everything was changed. So I'm like, oh, this is kind of, kind of weird. And uh, so I get out, to, get out to the set in Canton, and Russ Wolf's there, and he's sitting at this table at this place where we're set up at a restaurant. He's like, Sean, I, I said, Sean, have you seen this script? Yeah, it's interesting, because well, I didn't write anything. He goes, yeah, I know, we got we to rewrite all of this. So, at the time, oh they're shooting, he had a re he's writing. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you what, I like the director. I, I believe he's a great guy. I will probably work with him again on other stuff. I thought he delivered really good. But the edit that they gave was terrible. I heard it was horrible. I heard that no one at Pure Flix had actually watched it all the way through, the original edit of this film. I believe I talked to Rebecca St. James about it, too, and I believe the first edit, they wouldn't watch it either. They stopped watching it. You know, wow. it, it was that bad. I was sent a file of it. I, I immediately wrote a probably an eight-page um, <laughs> report of my opinions of the thing and um, to David White because we were getting really close to getting it done, and David hadn't even seen it. But here's what I realized. There was a good movie underneath. It was just really badly edited. It was just terribly edited. So I sent Dave the notes, and I, sa and I said, look, send me the drives. Send me the project. I can fix this. I said, but what I need to know is, are they, are they going to help us? Can they start working at the back, and I'll work from the front? and we could fix this movie. And um, he said, you know, let me send the notes to the director and the editor. I hear from him the next morning. I, I said, did you send my notes? He goes, no. What I did was I sent him a toned down version of your notes without any of the sarcasm. And I said, so how'd they take it? He goes, I heard the, the editor cried. So I said, so I guess they're not gonna help. And he's like, no. And he goes, <coughs> he goes he goes, I'll let you re-edit this film, but you have to have it done in a week because we're ready to go and uh -oh. we're ready to finish it. Gosh. And you know what? The reality is, and this is something, is they didn't care. Because if you've, if you've been looking at Christian films, you'll know that quality is never job one. <laughs> I mean, I'll say up and down the board. <laughs> yeah. You know, the filmmaking quality... 
am I lying? <laughs> Basically, and the audi- and here's the failing of the audience is, is that the audience goes for the films based on the message. Yeah. You know, not the filmmaking, not the story, not the acting, not the script. Really, it's just about the message. Yeah. So, I think Pure Flick's attitude on um, this, this Sarah's Choice was, it's a pro-life film starring Rebecca St. James. It's going to sell X number of co- copies. If it's good, it's going to sell that same n- number. If it's bad, it's going to sell the same number. So why fix it? And I think that was it. But, well, if I'm lying, um, look at all the movies. Yeah. I think the quality has increased now. I will say that, like, if you say, like, Affirm, I think does really good work. And, you know, a couple companies are doing consistently good work, right. professional quality work. But it's not, I, always, it's not just budget, because that's the one thing I hear. Oh, yeah. It's because of low budget. I'm like, no, there's a lot of yeah. low budget films yeah. that are fantastic. I grew yeah. up in the 90s watching going to low budget independent films, you know, and they were good. You know what I mean? That's right. All, you know, the 90s were filled with low budget films. And some of these films I, I made were higher budget than those films. And you'll always hear that. You'll always hear that on any... Um, Radio show, they're interviewing Christian yeah. filmmakers. It's the budget. It's the bu- it is not the budget. No. You know, and the, re- the only reason this exists is because the audience doesn't demand better movies. Right. You know, and um, when the audience finally says, we're not going to see this movie, you know, then, and we're not going to see the next one, we're not going to see the next one, we're not going to see the next one, and they're going to see the good ones, then suddenly, you know, the films will get better. But it's really, the onus is really on the audience because the people who are bean counters know that, you know, people are going to see this film based purely on message. Yeah. So why spend the money? And the, the sad thing is they are spend, they're spending enough, the same amount of money they can make. With that same amount of money, they could make a good film, you know, but there's no need. I'll continue my conversation with Sean Paul Murphy in the next episode. You can find links to Sean's blog in the show notes for this episode. And you can find us on the web at ministryofmotionpictures.org.